God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you today through God our Father and through our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I suspect most of us, if you're like me, do not come from a military background, don't have that experience. I know we have some here who do. Shoes are probably not the first thing that you'd think of if you're heading into battle. If I were to send you into an armory back in the days before firearms, like when this book of Ephesians was written, you'd probably be like me and go for the sword first, right? You want to go check out the swords, the shields, then maybe you go for your helmet. It might exactly be the 180 for the experienced soldier. They're probably going first to find the best shoes, especially if they've had the experience of a forced march or have needed to hold the line for days or weeks on end. There are lots of books and movies that are filled with these images of poor, ordinary soldiers who are struggling to protect their feet from the elements. Whether it's the cold, and I think of Washington's army at Valley Forge in that freezing winter, or from the wetness and the dampness, like the trench foot, which is where it got its name, the trenches in Europe during World War I which was also a really common ailment for soldiers who were in the South Pacific or in, the, in World War II or in Vietnam, right? This trench foot phenomenon. Shoes, or lack of them, quality of them, can turn the tide of a battle. Has anybody here ever heard of the story about how Scotland got its national flower, the thistle? Here's how it happened. In order to take the sleeping Scots by surprise, an army of Norman invaders was going to take off their shoes so that they could cross a field in silence. But instead of stealth, what happened was after the commander sent them to go barefoot, they came across all of these thistles in the ground, and as they were yelping in pain, stepping on the thistles, it awoke the Scots, who were then able to rout the would-be invading army. And it's been the national flower of Scotland ever since. So too, shoes and stance go closely together. Athletes, soldiers, anybody in this type of role knows the importance of being able to carry a proper stance. Many, if not all, forms of martial arts depend on this. Same thing goes for boxing or weightlifting. Your shoes and your stance, they matter. And when you have mastered a stance, it doesn't matter what your enemy is coming at you with. You're able to withstand them and stay immovable in the face of your opponent. So then, even if you're a civilian like me, you might be able to be persuaded that the shoes are really important. There's a 19th century journal, uh, journalist whose name is Walter Badgett, and he said that the great soldier is not the one whose head is filled of these dreams of fighting for his lady or for king and country and these ideals, but rather the good soldier is the one who's concerned with the most mundane details, like the quality of his shoes. And the same thing is true of a Christian soldier. There are descriptions of Yahweh, God himself, as a soldier. There's one of these descriptions in Isaiah 59. There his shoes aren't described. So maybe we'd find it strange that Paul is so focused upon this until you think of what Paul has been through when he's writing this letter to this little church in Ephesus. Paul's been arrested. He's been taken by Roman soldiers. Paul is in chains and for all of these miles, the footfalls of the soldiers marching, 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 days and weeks on end. And then he's under house arrest and the guards with their boots. Paul's thinking about these things. How is it then that this gospel, this good news about Jesus Christ, can serve as footwear for the Christian soldier? Remember that the command that's given to a Christian soldier is a very simple one. Stand. Stand. Not attack, and certainly not retreat, but simply stand. Stand where you are. This whole armor of God that has been equipped 
to us by God enables a person to stand his or her ground in the face of an assaulting enemy. So what can make such a command even possible given the strength and fury of our foe? Well, Paul knows that the soldier needs protection. And what soldier can stand firm and steadfast if their feet are wounded? If we're going to maintain our stance in the middle of this onslaught, we have to be certain that our feet aren't going to be vulnerable. Just as a shield of faith protects us from the fiery darts of the evil one, so too does the gospel promise forgiveness in Jesus for our sin protect our stance from all of the shots and the thrusts and the stomps of the attacker. We're not going to be able to stand in place just because of our courage or our strength or our righteousness but rather through the good news and the help and comfort that we get to stand on what Jesus has done for us. So too, Paul's soldier needs shoes that have traction. Maybe it sounds like an odd chain of images to be strung together here, moving from the gospel to peace to readiness, and then into that firm stance. But when you really think about it, it kind of makes sense. Because that peace that we all enjoy in Christ's death for us means that we don't need to worry anymore about whether or not God loves us. Our feet are firmly planted in that truth. We can meet attacks knowing no matter what may come that God is going to hold us firm without wavering or trembling or slipping. And it means that being together again in Christ brings peace that we need not be overcome with every care or worry that comes our way. We're at the ready. And so we can start to see why the shoes of the soldier gets so much attention, can't we? Helmet, breastplate, sword, shield, yes, all very important. But the sword can't do much damage if you're knocked to your feet and the sword is down on the ground. We need those shoes that help us to stand firm. It is only the gospel, only the good news And that gospel is wrapped around our feet. But Paul prays that the words would be given to him to proclaim that mystery boldly. You see, we don't attack. We speak. We speak with boldness. Here we have this picture of this fully armored soldier, this Christian warrior in mind. And he says to speak with boldness pray that we might be able to show off those shoes, the good news that Jesus has given us. We pray that we could reveal the mystery of those shoes. Now, when Paul uses the word mystery in our text here today, he's not referring to mystery in the sense of like the History Channel special about UFOs, right? Ooh, it's a mystery. And it's not referring to Sherlock Holmes and how we're going to find clues and evidence and come together with a hypothesis and solve the puzzle with our cleverness that no one else can devise. Instead, this is a mystery in the Christian biblical sense of the term, that God is revealing, unveiling something, pulling back the curtain for us to be able to see something that we otherwise haven't been able to see before, that we've never known before. God's showing us something that we can't solve on our own. And Paul's prayer then is that we, who've already been shown that mystery, would be able to share that same mystery with the rest of the world. The good news of Jesus Christ, dead and raised. And that happens when the shoes enable Paul and the Christian soldier to stand up with boldness and speak of Jesus The way that Paul's boldness worked fits perfectly with this use of mystery. To be bold is simply to speak freely, to speak your mind. There's none of that kind of feeling things out. I don't really know if I'm 
using the right words around you, the comfortable way that you might talk to somebody that you know really well, a family member, a close friend, right? We're not trying to measure those things. And certainly that does take some courage, but Paul's main concern is that he'd be totally unencumbered from being able to preach the gospel in all of its beautiful and boldness and purity. But to do so in a natural and a winsome way. And when that secret is boldly and lovingly shared, it's not an occasion to, well, you know, I kind of think maybe I should tell you. No. This is the opportunity that we have to speak the truth of God's love for the world. And it's that same good news that allows us to take such a solid stance without wavering or stumbling, like Paul did before the emperor himself. And it's the same gospel with all that it speaks to us of his mercy, grace, and compassion before God that secures your stance and mine. And then, standing on that peace, we're ready for whatever attacks might come at us. Not ready to advance with a weapon, but ready to proclaim God's word. Our feet are protected. Our stance is secure. We are standing in what God has done for us, making us his through Jesus. And that fills us with a peace to boldly proclaim in the midst of whatever might be coming our way. The same good news. Because there is nothing that can stand against what God is doing. No weapon, no strategy, no subterfuge, no insult, not even physical injury or death to yourself can stop God from advancing his cause or to shake the stance of those who have been shod, their shoes put on by God in the gospel. God bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in faith. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.